Okay. Well, we've gotten that awkward greeting thing out of the way, so now we can get started. Woo! Everybody having a good convention? Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's Sunday and you're here and we're going to talk about social media and uncover the secrets of the universe or something like that. And I'm going to start with uh, panel introductions down there. Oh, lucky me. Yes. Um, good morning. I'm Jim Nettles. Uh, I am a fiction and a nonfiction author. Uh, I work in tech. I, I, I've been in e-com. I've built out a lot of these different systems over the years. Uh, I'm also a privacy speaker and advocate as well, so you're going to hear me kind of rail on both sides. Um, also, uh, I've got some cards up here. We also have Author Essentials, which is on the business side of being an author, which we've launched, which has our, our first workshop is John down here doing his Path to Pub. Uh, we've got more stuff coming out later this year as well, so please do grab some swag as well. Hello, I'm uh, Eric Asher. I'm the author of the Vesic Urban Fantasy series and the Steamborn YA Steampunk series, as well as Mason Dixon Monster Hunter and some other randomness. Google me. Um, I've been focusing on social media marketing for a few years to help build my brand, so I guess that's why Gail let me up here. I'm John Hartness, and I bought a round of alcoholic ice cream for the panel. <laughs> I'm the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books, a small press based out of Charlotte, North Carolina, and I write science fiction, fantasy, urban fantasy, horror, comedy. Um, basically, if it's wildly inappropriate or booze-laced, I'm your guy. Hi, I'm Gail C. Martin. I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, steampunk, comedic horror, and other stuff. Um, and as Morgan Bryce, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. But also as Gail Z. Martin, I write some nonfiction. I've got uh, four social media books out. 30 Days to Social Media Success was named by Lifehack to be one of the top 20 business books to read in 2016. And the new one, The Essential Social Media Marketing Handbook, tells you why the stuff you were doing last year isn't working anymore and what to do about it. I happen to have one copy left with me. Come see me after if you want it. Um, my MBA was in marketing and systems analysis, which was a really, really weird combination people tried to talk me out of back in 1984, because they said the two had nothing to do with each other. And I said, go away, you bother me, I'll make it work. Um, so lo and behold, marketing and computers, they have something to do with each other. And um, so we're going to talk about social media for authors and creators. And these guys are up here because they do it really, really well and I wanted them to share some of their tricks and tips with you. Um, so let's kind of, and, and we will open it up to questions, uh, but I, I want to cover some territory before then. So what do you guys think is the most important thing authors, developers, creators need to realize about social media? John? You're your brand. You are your brand. and readers and buyers can smell bullshit a mile away so don't I was on a panel yesterday where I referred to my public persona as me cranked to 11 with the knob ripped off mm -hmm. I posted to Instagram from this panel that I bought a round of booze ice cream for the panel and then I and I felt followed up with piss off it's on brand <laughs> because for me it is on brand and I did. <laughs> so I think that it is very important to, for authors and creators to realize that you do have to be sincere because disingenuity will get called out and will be found out almost immediately. Oh, I have to follow John. Um, yeah, so I totally agree with that. Um, something else I think people need to come to, with, yeah. come to terms with with social media is that a lot of the organic reach is not there anymore, uh, especially if you're talking about like the Facebook platform. Um, but in place of organic reach, they have instituted a phenomenal advertising system that allows you to really customize your audiences. And I think it's important not to listen to the people that will tell you Facebook ads don't work, Facebook ads don't work, whatever kind of ads don't work. A lot of them don't understand how the algorithms operate, haven't really worked with the representatives to improve all of their advertising. 
And I'm going to build on top of all that. So it, it, it's exactly right. It's now a paid market. I mean, social media has now entered the teenage years, which means it's going to cost you money. So I mean, it's uh, going to ask me for the keys to the car. <laughs> and yes, then crash Dad, it. And crash it after we drank the alcoholic ice cream because you've been a bad influence. It says right uh, here on the carton, don't lick and drive. <clears throat> Oh, Oh, that's a different panel. I was going to say something, and I forgot that was last night's panel. Um, No, uh, when you're dealing with things from a social media perspective, it is a couple of things. You, you, once again, you're you're not being yourself. It's not your personal page and stuff like that. Keep that separate. If you are doing things to be on brand, and you know, like me and my social media presence is off and on I post about a number of different things I don't do a whole lot of personal stuff because well we're back to that whole privacy advocacy thing but when you're going out and building your brand do it stay on topic keep things within the brand and be aware of what you're doing but it's going to cost you money and treat it like a business do your research understand your market understand how the technology works because if you don't you're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of money, and all you're going to wind up doing is chasing cat videos instead of doing things that help your audience, help your brand, help you actually you know, do business, and help you to engage with people. Because what social media is really good for is allowing people to connect with you. The you you want to present, but the you you present should be the best you, or in John's case, him turned up to 11, which is just as good as it's going to get. In my case, the worst you. <laughs> well, and, and I, I want to kind of pick up on, on what both John and Jim have said because it's, it's you curated. Um, so it's the public you. Uh, John's often said, you know, you're on from the time you walk out of the room in the morning when you're at an event like this and you're an author. So you have to be your best self. Maybe you feel like, maybe, maybe you're just on your last nerve in that crowd and you really feel like giving the dumbass in front of you a shove <laughs> because they're moving so slowly, you really can't do that. It isn't nice and, you know, people will read your name tag know who you are. Um, so always be your best you because people will remember it will follow you home, someone will see, someone will quote, it will be on the internet, and, and you don't want to screw up your brand. And you need all the friends you can get. So curate that you, and every, everybody slips up sometime. Everybody makes that post you shouldn't make, or that smart remark you shouldn't make to the wrong person at the wrong time. You know, not that, not that we're all perfect, but a little forethought can dig you out, uh, can, can avoid having to dig out and, and shamelessly grovel for <laughs> forgiveness. Yeah, and if I can, oh, if I, I want to. I was having a conversation very similar to this last night on after my third panel and a two hour meetup on my way to a 9 p.m. meeting, which was then followed by a 10 p.m. meeting. (laughs) So I was talking with a a new writer that is just getting started and talking about that very thing. And I want to do a quick survey. How many of you have ever met someone that is famous or in the public eye in any way? How many of you have ever met someone that is famous and in the public eye and they were an asshole? How Other many than of John. You will never, ever forget that. And it doesn't matter what else that person does, that is, good, that is, your, that is your meeting of them. There's an old saying that says, don't ever meet your heroes. And I have met through the course of my writing career, I've been fortunate enough to meet many of my heroes, and most of them have been wonderful. And one hasn't. And it colored my interaction with him for years. And I met him before I was a writer. I was a fan, getting something signed, and he was a dick. And I've remembered it for 20 years. And for the record, I met him again two years ago, and he's still a dick. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and you know, everybody does have a bad day. Everybody screws up. So there is also, is it a pattern of dictum? That's why I well. checked back in after 18 years. Hashtag. Well, well. But, that's, but that's what I was saying to this writer was, I try very hard to at least be, char- be 
self-deprecating, mildly amusing, and somewhat charming because it helps mitigate the fact that I'm kind of a drunken idiot. <laughs> so I want people's first impression of me to at least be mildly amused if I can't get impressed and adored. And, and the only thing I want to throw on top of that is, remember, in the world of social media, nothing ever goes away, and you have to stay on brand continuously. Look at what has happened to James Gunn. Oh, and pursuant to that, there's an app called Tweet Delete that you can set the time frame for which it erases all tweets over a certain amount of time, and if you're not famous, people haven't screen capped that crap. And yeah, there are archives, but it's harder to find those. So, yeah, my stuff deletes after a year. So let's talk about what you think the biggest mistake is that most creators make in social media. Jim? They spend too much time watching cat videos and not doing things on brand. Um, because social media, Facebook, all this sort of stuff, we can convince ourselves it's research and get sucked into a social media hole. We get sucked into drama. We get sucked, in, sucked into conversations. If you look at the current environment, everything's just extraordinarily polarized. If you're trying to sit down, write, get work done, and out the door, this is just going to taint your position you're starting from. And so if you've already let that get in your head, you can easily have shot your day, and you've neither engaged with your fans or used social media for what it's good for, and you've now tainted your work for the day. Uh, I, I, I absolutely agree with that, and I think probably all of us will agree with that. Um, but more so, out of all the writers that I talk to, I think the biggest mistake they make is discounting the effectiveness of paid advertising, which is probably going to be what I parrot for most of this panel. <laughs> because it's, uh, it's really changed my author career. I mean, the, the paid advertising, the reach, the number of readers I have, the sales, revenue, everything. And it's, it's really good. And I find a lot of people, they're like, ah, it's just not worth it. I don't pay for that. I'm traditionally published, so my royalties aren't high enough to do this. And it's, ah, everybody can do it. You can, you can do it for as little as $5 a day, which I know can be a stretch for some people, but I mean, it doesn't have to be like the hundreds of dollars a day spend like a lot of people talk about. So, you might have noticed that we're all friends. <laughs> and being friends with people you're on panels with means that you can disagree with them and still be friends. And Jim and I have fundamental disagreements about a lot of things. One of them is, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they whitewash their social media too much mm. and avoid controversy and controversial positions too much, and it makes them bland and disingenuous. Um, and, it, and for some people, and depending on what level of reach you're looking at, if you, if you are Coca-Cola, you cannot afford to piss someone off. If you are a mid-list fantasy author, you can make a living off of a much smaller number of people who like you, so you can piss some people off. Well, uh, <clears throat> let, let me put one caveat on that. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you frequently on this, but again, it depends on what your brand is. Absolutely. That's the caveat. If you, I, I keep a lot of my stuff very clean because of professionally a lot of the things that I do. You can do and get away with a lot more than mm -hmm. I can but also, it's also a difference in personality. Absolutely. I am an asshole. Yes. But. <laughs> Wait, was this another time that I was supposed to disagree with you? <laughs> I think it also requires knowing what group you're playing with and, of course, realizing that regardless of which group you're playing with, if you're on social media, everybody else can see. But there are... As John said, we do a lot of this stuff together. We road trip together. There are comments we make back and forth to each other because we know each other that are okay in our group because we're a little rough and tumble and we all have pretty thick skins. We but, will all behave very differently on panels where we don't know everyone. We all, we all share meals together every opportunity we get. These are my these are my friends as well as my coworkers. We caravan followers. across half the United States <laughs> in minivans together, you know. 
Um, but that's different. So, so sometimes the, the level of snarkiness, the smartassery, the, the comments that I can make on like, you know, a, a response to something John's posted is very different than I can make to somebody I don't know well. Oh, yeah, uh, or to somebody you know that, that doesn't have that bond so now that doesn't mean that somebody else won't see that post and maybe take it out of context or take offense to it so you have to always be mindful of that greater context and nowadays I think we're all just cranked up so hard and and on our last nerve that people take offense to everything uh, but you got to factor that in I'm offended by that yeah well because the grace period is nil Low anymore. Hanging fruit. yeah yeah <laughs> Because I, I didn't get this spot by not being lazy, so low-hanging fruit is all I'm going after. <laughs> but yeah, I completely agree with what Gail's saying in that, well, and some things, some things just are never funny. I'm sorry, some things just aren't funny. Mm -hmm. That list's pretty short, and it doesn't include beating up babies. Because punching babies is, is sometimes funny. I write comedy. He thinks. You can make it happen. <laughs> but... Some things just are never funny, and some things out of context are going to get you in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I think it's being mindful that everybody is always watching, and you don't know what's going to trigger somebody. So you also kind of have to look at what you're saying and kind of run it through that filter a second time and go, I know how I mean it. I know how the person I'm posting on will take it, but is there somebody out there who this is going to hit nerve and they're going to run with it and now I've got more trouble than the comments really worth and most of the time, yeah. Uh, at the same time, I agree with John, if there are things you personally really feel you need to make a stand on, then that's part of who you are, that's part of your brand, it's going to come out in your writing anyhow. Um, still try not to be offensive, that doesn't give you a blank check to be calling names and, and being you know disrespectful, try to make your point as uh, much in an adult way as you can, but people are going to kind of figure out where you're coming from through your writing, particularly if it's fiction, uh, sooner or later anyhow. Um, but realize that if you don't have to make enemies over something, um, you know, you also don't want to needlessly offend people who might have otherwise enjoyed your book. So that that's kind of a personal decision. You, gotta you have to make. Hill you're going to die on. Yeah, and it's not every hill, and it's Lord knows it's not every headline. And people don't really tune into you to be the news digest. They want to hear about other things. So you are heard best when you're heard rarely on some things, and then people pay attention. If it's always a rant, yeah, you know, people go elsewhere. What um, social media platforms have you found to be most effective? John? Are we counting newsletters as social media? Yeah. Um, because they're social and they're media mm -hmm. and they're electronic, yes. So I have found my newsletter to be the, um, the single most profitable piece of social media that I have. Um, I am just getting on to Instagram. I was trying to see if I could see how many, po how many likes my booze ice cream post had gotten, and I can't figure out how to see it because I said I'm just getting started on Instagram. But no, my newsletter is the most profitable and the highest, the highest benefit per cost of any of the platforms that I'm on. Uh, so for me, uh, I've also found that, like John, my newsletter is the best. Um, probably, probably started getting really effective once it got past about 3,000 people. I think I currently have about 12,000 people on my list now. So when I launch a book, my newsletter goes out to all those people, and whatever percentage of them buy it, it's essentially like them getting a new release notification, and it's it's great. It's a huge boost to uh, rankings and sales. Um, Instagram, I don't post regularly on Instagram, but I advertise regularly on Instagram, hmm. and that is really good. Like, and you can they they've combined Facebook advertising with Instagram advertising. Hmm. So you can now build a campaign in Facebook that goes exclusively to Instagram. And uh, one of my Facebook reps that I was working with actually tipped me off to the fact that you can get advertising into Instagram stories now, which probably annoys some people, but it's really effective. Um, you can only do like a 15 second video, 
but you can reach directly into those Instagram stories. And so as people are watching other people's stories, they'll get the little 15 second ad in between. If it's not terrible, maybe they'll click on it, buy it, and it's really nice. Uh, it used to be that those campaigns were tied into Facebook so you couldn't separate them. So you get traffic that was effective on Facebook, but because the demographic of users on Instagram is so different, it, it just, it was terrible. You know, it was just throwing money out the window. Um, and of course, always Facebook ads. I love them. Well, and for me, your newsletter is the only real estate you own. Your newsletter, your website, that's your real estate where you control all of it. Nobody can take it away from you. If somebody changes the rules on Facebook, if somebody changes the rules on Instagram, whatever else, you still own your newsletter. That's your real estate. So you control it so you can use that most effectively. It's the other social platforms that let you grow your newsletter, that let you grow the other following. So it's a matter of when you're doing the paid ads and the paid campaigns, what you're doing is you're, you're wanting to drive traffic not only to buy your book, but you're wanting to, to drive part of that traffic so it's growing your following. Because if I can get you on a mailing list and you're on my mailing list, I only want the people on my mailing list that want what I'm sending out the door. I've got pretty high open rates for when I send one out the door because it, it's not that often. But usually I, th I put a short story in there. I throw some, you know, not only news going out. It's not buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. It's usually, hey, here's what's going on. Here's where I'm going to be. Here's where I'm doing something stupid. Come watch because you never know when I'm going to do something stupid. Um, but if you're using the platforms, it's I don't think there's a single platform anymore. It's about you have to start with one, start with Facebook, and understand that these platforms are going to change over time. I'm I posted my first Instagram story last night video as we were walking over here to do a late night panel, um, that then brought a whole bunch of people going, "What are you doing?" Um, and so I was sort of going back and forth with that. But if you're using those platforms, the paid platforms, to help create and grow your real estate, that's when you get an effective solution overall with social media. But the, the only thing I'll say there is video is now the thing that helps deal with so many of the problems we see, like on Facebook. Because if it's a written comment, you don't necessarily have all the other social cues is this sarcasm? You know, was it a snarky comment? You know, so a lot of the things that get lost in written text, because even as writers, you know, we know what we meant when we said it. We just posted it out there, let it go. But video, if you record the short video, lets people see you, hear you, connect with you, and they also then get those social cues on that connected message. Yeah, and I mean, I, I use Facebook a lot to connect with readers, to connect with uh, other professionals to keep that conversation going and I try 99.9% .9 of the time to have a picture with that post whatever it is so that it adds that visual interest I need to do more video than I have been doing that's on my massive to-do list of endless tasks but it'll, it'll get done um, the newsletter I was reminded again how responsive people can be when they're truly interested in following you when we sent out a newsletter and we mentioned an upcoming title that will be out later this month and one of my beta readers within 10 minutes of the newsletter going out pinged me and said wait wait did I miss reading that did I miss beta reading that um, I, I didn't think it was out yet and I said it's not yet that was a coming attraction but cool you read the newsletter um, so so you have that continuing conversation and I have that conversation on, on Twitter um, where I've got people who, that's where I see reviews post, that's where I see readers make comments, that's where I can help support other authors by retweeting and reposting and talking about who else I'm on a panel with. So that's, I think, one of the other real powerful things here is don't just talk about what you're doing, talk about the other authors and creators that you respect, that you're friends with, that you think are a good match to your audience. And in talking about them, other people are going, hey, I like their taste. Well, maybe I like their books too. So it isn't all by my book. I want, I want you to go, I want you to do a little bit of a deep dive on okay. what I think is the smartest social media thing, marketing thing that you've done in the years I've known you and that you did completely by accident. Okay. <laughs> That's the way it usually works. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, the, the Facebook group. The supernatural, the yeah. whole supernatural thing. Okay. So, um, do we have any Supernatural fans out there? 
Yay, my tribe! So, what's the URL of the group? <laughs> it's it's the uh, it was the Supernatural Charlotte uh, 2018, but now it's Supernatural Charlotte Team Free Will NC TFWNC, um, and I posted that link in my picture of the Supernatural fan group panel I was on yesterday at Dragon Con and said, "Come on over, you guys. We're having fun here." Yeah. So um, how did so how did you get started? I, I came late to the party on Supernatural. I started uh, Larry and I started watching um, midway through season 11. Decided uh, we loved it, binge watched 11 seasons in four months so that I could be done in time for season 12 so I could start live tweeting all the episodes as one does. And got to know the people who run the two biggest fan sites, Winchester Family Business and Fangasm because I was reposting and retweeting them. All of this brought thousands of new followers to my Twitter account because I was posting about the show and posting daily pictures of the cast and talking about things to do with the show. So last weekend I was at the Charlotte Supernatural Convention and I'd never been to a Supernatural con. It works differently than this. It's kind of different audience going there. I didn't want to be at the con by myself. So I said, I'm going to start a Facebook group for everybody who's going to the Supernatural con and that way we can all get to know each other. Well, that group is now over 300 people. We not only had signage and had everybody meet at the con and did room parties, I gave out Mardi Gras beads and wore this really bright sparkly scarf at the con so people could see me get their beads and that way everybody knew they were part of the group so we had a group cohesiveness. And everybody said, we're having too much fun to quit just because the con's over. So we're starting to not on, we're planning to uh, group tweet and do discussion threads as the new episodes come out. And we're doing a new Harville's Roadhouse feature every month where wandering monster hunter authors like John and Eric come over and talk about monster hunting books they write that might not be about supernatural, but that Sam and Dean could wander into and feel right at home. And, and all of this happened because you were a genuine fan of the show and you started this with not much real idea. To, because I know you, and I know there, that somewhere in your lizard brain there was a hey, I can tie into these people because I write this stuff. But you didn't start tweeting, you didn't live tweet this stuff thinking, I'll leech these fans onto me. You live tweeted this stuff thinking, oh my God, this is awesome. Yeah, it was my husband's tired of hearing about this. Let's see if I can find other people to talk to. <laughs> uh, that <laughs> nodding not head in the second row, that's the, that's the husband that, that has heard way more about Sam, Dean, and Cass than ever needed to. Now... You know, did it occur to me that, hey, this is really urban fantasy. I write urban fantasy. I write about monster hunters. Maybe some of these folks will, you know, metaphorically follow me home. Yeah, and that has happened. Um, but first and foremost, it was genuinely fandom. Yeah, I picked, I picked up followers um, last month when I live tweeted. I live tweeted one of the WWE pay-per-views. I live tweeted SummerSlam. So I picked up fans... But you did this with authors and, and dragons. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. I, I Talk about authors and dragons. So I'm a cast member of the Authors and Dragons podcast. I play Fandingo the Fantastical, the loot hero. <clears throat> um, it's a podcast with six fantasy comedy authors playing Dungeons and Dragons really badly. Really badly. Really <laughs> badly. We may be the worst adventuring party in the history of Dungeons and Dragons. And I know a lot of you are thinking, nah, we're worse. And I'm like, we sank an island. <laughs> On accident. It, and, and I do credit Drew, the DM, for somehow or another not letting you kill yourselves. He's had to work at that a couple of times. But so the way Authors and Dragons happened is... Rick Galtieri contacted Robert Bevan and said, hey, uh, I kind of want to play D&D with writers. And Bevan's like, all right, I'm in. And then they contacted Drew Hayes because Rick and Bevan and Drew had all kind of converged on different Facebook groups, cross-promoting each other's work. And then they, they got to the core of the idea together, and one of them, and Rick and I, because we have written nerdy vampire books for almost 10 years we've we've crossed paths once or twice so rick emailed me and said hey you want to do this and i was like whatever i got every other thursday night free 
That was three years ago. We thought we might pick up a few of each other's readers and have a good time, and maybe we'll do half a dozen episodes or so. We had a we had a a woman and her father fly from Seattle to Charlotte this summer to see us do a live podcast. And we were all blown away. You ran a GoFundMe to bring one of your people from England to play that game. Twice. Twice. <laughs> yes, yeah, Steve Weatherill, who plays our, um, as he pr- as he says it, the sexually attractive monk, Brandon Thymaster. Yes, the monk's name is Brandon Thymaster. Well, Steve lives in Corby. Charlotte's a hub. It's expensive as crap to fly there. So we ran a GoFundMe for to bring Steve over because we don't monetize the blog, the podcast much. We have a Patreon that funds our our engineer so that our audio doesn't suck. But this is this is the same thing. We started this because it was fun. Mm-hmm. We kept going because we were hanging out with our friends playing Dungeons and Dragons. We were a year and change into it before we realized that there were more than a couple dozen people listening. Because we're, we were bad at monetizing and at analytics. Well, we're still bad at monetizing. But our analytics were awful, so we really thought that there might be 50 people listening. So the so point here is, don't go for things that are necessarily contrived. Social media doesn't have to be work. You can connect deeply to your audience by doing the stuff you love and just letting other people hang out with you. And Authors and Dragons proves that you don't even have to do things you love well. (laughs) Yeah, and and this kind of Facebook party sort of thing is another way to have a Facebook connection with other... We're going to be doing that. We've done this already on book launches. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing this again with the Harvel's Roadhouse feature on the the Team Free Will uh, and Seep group. And and it's it's a wonderful way to invite other people who do what you do and all bring portions of your own audience. And then you guys, you have a conversation. You lob questions back and forth to each other. You you collaborate and, and you have this discussion you let other people be in on. Uh, I think there's an important note about, when, as you mentioned, Facebook parties. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, back in the day, like five years ago, you could do a Facebook party that was like its own standalone event. People would just share posts in it. You get a ton, ton of engagement, ton mm-hmm. of traffic. Those are pretty much dead. Yeah. Like they don't really work anymore. But if you tie an event like that to an established group, it can be really, yes. really good. So, Absolutely. And yeah. talk a little bit about Facebook groups. Uh, so Facebook groups, I like I myself, I use a group for what is considered a launch team. So like I have mm-hmm. a, a central core of like my best and most awesome fans, one of which might be in this room. And uh, basically we just we talk about the books, we talk about other people's books that we enjoy. We just share memes back and forth. I mean, it's most of the year it's nonsense, but then when like a release is coming up and I need beta readers or I need ARC readers or anything like that, all these people hop on board to help me out and then they help with promotion, sharing things across their platforms. Some of them are also writers, so they'll share it out to their newsletter. Uh, so by having that group with just a few hundred people in it, um, it, it enables me to reach thousands and thousands of other readers through these other um, readers that are excited about my work and I think you know that's also something to keep in mind is that you can interact with a group that by its membership looks fairly small but if those people are echoing your message to their audience that that exposure grows exponentially and if you are connecting with multiple groups in a significant meaningful way that 500 here, 300 there, 1,000 there adds up. Mm-hmm. Another thing that groups give you is a way to create some of the some of the shield that Jim right. is going is looking for, and I am too. Mm-hmm. Um, I have scaled back the number of the friend requests that I accept on my main page 
and uh, as I try to shift that into people that I really know and my family so that I can see all of the stuff that's happening with them as opposed to the other 3,000 people yeah. on my Facebook. So as I get requests now, I have a form letter that I hope isn't insulting. I tried. But I say, hey. You tried to be insulting. You tried not to be insulting. I don't that, ever you have left to, that very, very he, ambiguous. I don't ever have to try to be insulting. Okay. It, that comes naturally. <clears throat> but I, my, I have a form response. This is, hi, I'm sorry. I can't remember if we've actually met. I do restrict my, this page to people I know in real life and my family. So if you're a writer and you would like to network, then please like my Facebook page or join my group. If you are someone that I met at a con and you're a fan, please join my group because you'll get more out of it fan-wise than you'll get more out of it fan-wise in my group because you may not care about the personal life things that I'm going to post on my personal page. But if we've hung out and your cat is your profile picture, I'm horrible with names and I did a lot of drugs in the 90s. So I don't remember all of that stuff. So please send me a little reminder and say, hey, hey, we had dinner at Sway, you idiot. <laughs> okay. So I try to, I use that and I point people towards my group because there's a lot of authors that I've never met that, ha that are releasing their very first book that, j that are, it's, they're kind of collecting other writers on Facebook like Pokemon and that's awesome if you really want to engage and you really want to be my friend, but don't just friend me and then immediately try to get me to pitch your book oh, yeah. if yeah. I've never met you, if I've never read you, if, I've ne if it's your first book and I've never heard of you. Um, and don't do it to, and certainly don't do it to anybody bigger than me. Um, because it's not real cool, but it happens. It happens every day somewhere. It happens a couple of times a week to me. It probably mm -hmm. at least this, as much to you guys. Well, and, and here's the other thing about Facebook groups. Now, for a long time, Facebook was trying to get you to cultivate pages. Now, really, pages are all good for is building your ad platform. But Facebook groups give you something else because it's not just you connecting with fans. It's also when you're building that group of fans and they start to interact and they build those relationships, that's, that sort of community is gonna help you tremendously because that community also helps to reflect you and your brand. Rick Gualtieri's Facebook group is one of the most active single author fan groups I've ever seen and Rick posts on there maybe once a day most days and that thing, if I had to, I had to kill notifications because that thing was jamming my feed. It was so much. I'm still in yeah. the group because those people are funny. There's a, there's another big thing that just started up with uh, Facebook groups that you guys may or may not have heard of. Uh, they're now letting you associate. They're starting to roll that. out, but they're now letting you associate a pixel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with your Facebook group. Yes. So you can build lookalike audiences off of Facebook. Groups. Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. Y'all, so. y'all go ahead. I got to make a note. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on an article for it, so yeah, it's yeah. killer. Um, but if you if you can cultivate those groups properly, which does mean having good moderators and good people to help police it for you, but once that becomes your core group, they will do everything they can to protect you and help you grow. Or All in right. Rick's case, you know. Well, anyway. Um, okay, yeah. so let's let's take some questions here. Uh, yeah. What's the minus of using a pen name on social media? Do you use a pen name for your creation, or do you just want to use a pen name on social media? Uh, my real name is actually an English actor, and I'm, I've been using a pen name for the public. I've actually been using multiple pen names because I do different uh, types of books. You, you want people to find you. So the harder you make it for people to find you and your work, the less effective it's going to be. 
So if you are using a pen name for your work, then maybe you know, then then let people know that that's also you. Um, but people have to be able to find you. So I'm not a fan of the current trend of authors using multiple pen names for multiple genres. Um, I think it. I I think there are two ways to go about it. One is they're very open, like Kim Harrison, Don Judd, Nora Roberts, J.D. Robb, David B. Coe, D.B. Jackson. These are very open, and these are publishing industry dictated pen names, or people who write, who have day jobs and write genres that their day job would not approve of. Those both make sense to me, but there's a tr growing trend among authors to have a science fiction pen name and a fantasy pen name and a and a pen name for their thrillers and I find I think that's insulting to the to their audience and their readers. I write everything under my own name. I accept the very few un, ungodly bad erotica titles that I wrote that you will never find and you will not ever find that pen name and it's not because I'm ashamed of writing erotica, I'm ashamed of writing badly. <laughs> well, and, and just to and jump jump on that thought, I started writing um, I, I've written the urban fantasy, epic fantasy, steampunk, and all that is Gail Z. Martin. I started writing urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance as Morgan Bryce, and that's a branding thing. I'm very open about it. It's on all my pages. Hey, I'm both of these people. What was the difference? Well, the, the Gail Z. Martin, the, the standard fiction, doesn't have any explicit sex in it. The paranormal romance does. I didn't want to inadvertently give anybody a heart attack because they picked up my book and got more than they bargained for. It's a very um, different flavor of longsword. Well, yeah. and, and walking the PTA or better yet with the DSS court on your ass when you have uh, branded yourself a 23 year old bisexual female and the pro support four different novels all of my well, kids are adults, and they now tell all their friends that their mom writes male, male paranormal romance. It has yeah. become a branding thing for them. <laughs> and, and I do, I, I am, I'm cutting down on some of it, but I write under, I mean, urban fantasy and a lot of the fiction, I, was, I, I still have a pen name that I use, but I'm sort of merging all of it because, well, A, I'm lazy. B, I've never hidden it. Um, I initially did that because... It separates me professionally for some of the things that I do, and pretty much everybody. I've, I've long been out of the writing closet anyway, and they just sort of look at me, shake their heads, and go, "You're not right anyway, but you're good at what you do." So we're just not going to ask. Okay, um, next question. <laughs> just because we're moving along, yeah. I think they got a catch box out there. Yeah. Okay. Is well, I think he has. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, so I do social media for an independent board game company, which I know is a little different than you know books and everything. But um, we had a lot of success just virally for a long time, and now that that's kind of waning a little bit, we're moving more into advertising and things like that. So you harked on Facebook advertising and Instagram advertising being very helpful. Um, one of the things that you know you hear tossed around a lot, and I think one of you mentioned this, was not to spend too much money on Facebook advertising. So part, part of my question is, what do you think about that? Do you agree or disagree? It sounds like you disagree, but kind of curious in more detail. And the second thing is, going into that, how do you find how much to spend? What kind of budget to set for those kind of things? What kind of is your process in exploring what, what to do with it? I, I'm going to defer to Eric because his methodology is more um, more worked out than mine. For me, um, I set my budget based on what I can afford to spend. Um, it's pretty okay. easy. And I'm learning from these guys. Uh, so when I first started, I started out like when I when I fire off a new campaign, uh, I'd start at five dollars a day. Like that, was, I did not mind risking that. And basically, when you're starting a new campaign, don't spend more on it than you're willing to lose because it is. Some of them you're going to start and you're like, this is great, and it's going to tank, um, and all that money will just be gone. But. As I've gotten older and more impatient, I'll start a lot of my campaigns out at $20 a day because it'll get me the results faster. Um, another thing that a lot of people won't tell you is that you need to let that campaign run for at least seven days because the algorithm needs time to sort out who it's hunting down. So when you build your lookalike audiences and it's like a million people, you can narrow that down and get it down if you want. But uh, one thing that I've learned is if you just run it at that monster lookalike size, 
the algorithm will actually learn who's engaging better and it will start to come down but it's going to need like five to seven days at least to figure that out uh, if you started at five dollars a day don't just jump it to twenty dollars a day once it starts doing well uh, the problem with that is it totally fries the algorithm and if it had traction before i don't know why but it'll lose it um, basically you don't want to Im increase your budget by more than 30 percent at a time and that's that's the high end. I usually do 20% just to be safe. Um, and then you will hit a tipping point as you keep ratcheting that up. Usually it's somewhere between 50 and $75 a day where it won't get better. If you go beyond it, you'll break it. And there's no hard line. So th it's, it's a lot of testing. Uh, if you want to change your creative on that campaign, duplicate the campaign, kill the original campaign, and update the creative on the new one because that starts the algorithm over, you get a whole new batch to work with, and it, it's far more effective. I always thought, oh, but there was 500 likes on that other ad, I'm losing my social proof. Doesn't matter. Like, you can have, you can have a, a photo that has no likes sell 10 times better on a new campaign than the previous one. So yeah, when I said uh, earlier, I didn't mean to say don't spend a lot of money on Facebook ads, but if you don't want to spend a lot of money in the beginning for testing, you don't have to. Like five dollars a day will help you establish what's effective and what's not. And I okay. still don't spend a lot of money. I spend. I I'm currently running three campaigns, and they're all at five dollars a day. Yeah. That's just that's what's in my budget over the summer months because I have this little convention that I go to at the very beginning of September and hotel rooms for that show are expensive. I want to come back well, to the gentleman here. Thank you. Um, so I have a podcast, Combo Breakers podcast here in Atlanta. Uh, we just started uh, last year and I am learning the art of podcasting and social media marketing and putting out content as I go along and something that has uh, come up fairly often that I don't understand is the concept of like the newsletter and having the email list in in my brain I don't know who answers like gets an email from someone and opens it so I don't know how to make it successful for myself so I need um, so here's just a, how do I navigate that here's a dead easy way the there's a new book released called newsletter ninja Newsletter Ninja. Newsletter Ninja released within the last three weeks. The author is a woman named Tammy Lebrec, who I know and like, and she taught she gives you a lot of these step by step ways and philosophies to build a solid newsletter. And I believe that what she is talking about is going to be the blueprint for successful newsletters for the next at least two years. The other thing to remember is you can have a huge following on social media, but platforms don't stick around forever. And if Facebook disappeared tomorrow, you have no way to reach those people. And they don't have a great mechanism to reach you. If you have a newsletter and you use that to stay in touch with your most engaged fans, you are you now own that list it's not going to vanish if the newsletter provider goes away you can export that and take it with you because it's yours okay. uh yeah yeah that's what i was mentioning about being your part of your real estate mm -hmm. uh, yeah. this is a project because you don't have the microphone oh. sorry i actually operated in music instead of um, books but uh, uh, my question is, uh, what do you feel about uh, like prefab websites instead of building your own homepage? Like, if I want to basically save time and not write a uh, not write an algorithm just to do to send newsletters and whatnot, um, um, like a Wix site or uh, in my I, case, it's called Bandcamp. Oh, um, I think Bandcamp's yeah. fine. Okay. So industry specific ones can do you well like that. Here's going to be the challenge for that, and, and I've written a lot on this over the years. Again, we're back to the real estate you own and how portable it becomes. So if you're using someone else's platform and you're using someone else's technology, it's just like social media. If they make a change in the rules, it's going to change the game on you immediately. My first website for five years was a Blogspot website. Mm -hmm. 
So as soon as I wanted, as soon as I switched over to writing fiction and pursuing writing professionally and wanting people to give me money, I, I bought my domain because I did not want it to say blah 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 dot blogspot.com. I wanted mm-hmm. it to say johnhartness.com. And okay. But it, the, the other thing I'll say about is from a platform perspective, especially if you start looking to sell or do things like that directly through, you have to look at the terms and conditions on the site or you can wind up getting into trouble. Yeah, so for example, WordPress is has been okay with having commercial content on it, but LiveJournal and Blogger and some of those are not. If you create your site and, and use a WordPress site, for example, you even if you, you can put the whole site together yourself, if you do have somebody set it up to make it look a little nicer and a little fancier, you can still make those updates yourself without having to pay somebody every time you want to put a new post on there. Uh, but yeah, what Jim said about check your terms and conditions. Uh, yeah, back in the back. Wait, we got oh, yeah, he's, sorry. He's, okay, we have a box. So, all right, so uh, I, I have had questions like every three minutes, or every one of you. Okay, but, uh, <laughs> we, so do, I'm a we do one-on-one I'm a one candidate. consulting in exchange for alcohol. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a candidate, uh, decided this year I'm going to be a candidate, and have had to learn all the stuff about social media and advertising and packaging and branding, uh, and I've learned it in the last six months. Like incredibly and uh, the question I started out with is branding and so uh, you know I am branding myself mm-hmm. I have now uh, I you know my personal page was uh, where I started out at I had that the quote-unquote business page I guess is what they yep. call it now and it's, of course it's my same name it makes that a little confusing very thank you very much for you know making that distinction between you know how you're going to make friends and stuff the question is, is that when you're trying to stick to branding, and in my case, I am the election reform candidate bringing election reform to the election. That's what I talk about. I talk about all kinds of things, election reform. There's this debate going on about whether I should put more personal or more interesting stuff that is to, you know, to to um, put things out there. Like I'm in Dragon Con this week. I'm, I'm attending EFF or stuff like that. The other question that I wanted to find out, the second part of this, I'll just go ahead and say it now, is once you guys get somebody on Twitter or on Instagram, uh, do y'all have like a like from eight o'clock in the morning to ten o'clock in the morning? You're like responding to people, or how are you? How are you? You get all these eyeballs, but how are you actually following up with? Them? A couple of things. Uh, first off, let me say a word about those Facebook pages. And, and Jim mentioned this, I think, before. Fa- when when Facebook pages came up, they were the alternative to having everybody talk about everything on their profile. And for a while, you know, Facebook wanted us all to build a business page, and we all took a lot of ads and boosted posts and all kinds of things to drive traffic and get people to like those, those pages. And then Facebook got kind of greedy and said, yeah, you've attracted thousands of people to your business page that you paid to attract there, but we're going to hold them hostage and not let those people see your posts unless you pay extra for each post. So the organic reach on a Facebook page is down to like 1% to 3%. Facebook groups, on the other hand, at least until they change the algorithm, everything you post, everybody gets a notification on. So that's an important distinction. So I'm going to go real quick because we're all we're running really tight on time. Peop, I can't speak to voters. I can't speak to candidacy, but from but I believe that it transfers. People buy shit from people they like. So. What, if I were if I were running for public office, God help us all. <laughs> um, I would post the hell out of pictures from Dragon Con because everyone would know I'm a huge nerd. And cat pictures. I would um, yeah. There I would be judicious in what cosplay I put on my candidate page, but uh, depending on my brand. But yeah, as lo- I believe that as long as you're being genuine with your platform, you can be more genuine on your platform page. But that's my belief. No, I, uh, I agree. Yep. Absolutely, because part of being a candidate, and I grew up in a political family, part of being a candidate yeah. is knowing who you that's are as a person. Box. So, yeah, absolutely. And the last question, the guy with the box in the back. Um, Here we go. How do you speak into your box? That's the whole purpose of having it. Yeah. It's not the prize. You get to speak okay. into it. Um, how do you get fans to interact on your page? 
Cat yeah, that pictures. seems to be a problem Cat. right now. I shit you not, cat pictures. John Scalzi posted a Twitter picture of his cat with two pieces of bacon on it, and it has gotten more interaction than any post he's ever done in his career. And this is a man who signed the biggest book, a, a bigger book deal than all four of us put together have ever signed. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, um, funny memes, funny pictures funny you know if you can look at your life with the sense of humor and post about funny things um you know humor goes a long way i put out cooking because i love to cook so if i'm sitting out there on the on the egg i'm on the grill whatever else pulling stuff off lots of food whatever it is you're passionate about i don't care if that's knitting or or you know cooking or whatever it is post pictures of it talk about it Folks, we are now out of time. Thank you guys. You have been wonderful being here. Have a great convention. And don't forget, I do have one copy of the book. Gail has, a couple of co has one copy of her book. I have a couple of copies of one of my novels. We have swag. We have swag. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you London. Good night. <laughs>